Hey, good morning, everyone. It's great to see you and great to have you here as we continue our Jonah series. Thanks for being a part of it. You know, we're in that new season now. It's, it's this, this day is like close to Christmas for me. I love daylight savings, not because I lose an hour, okay, but because I gain an evening, and I just love evening sun. It's so great. How many of you love driving home at five or six in complete darkness, and now you can get all sorts of jobs done in the evening, right? But, but here we are in daylight savings. Some of, you, some of you have changed your clock, and it reminds you that there are seasons, there are seasons for change. And that's true in our own lives too, isn't it? Isn't it just true that there's different seasons? How many of you have lived long enough to realize life doesn't stay stagnant? You go through different seasons of your life. And the different seasons bring along different challenges. But one of the things I love about spring, being a big baseball fan and being a part of baseball, just love the, the, the air. I love the excitement of spring. I love how we look forward to summer, all these things. It's great. But there is this moment of suffering right there on that morning hours, right, that, that some of you uh, are going through right now. And so if you sleep through this message, God's grace, he loves you. Sorry, right. I'm glad you feel so comfortable, all right? Just, just if you see somebody nodding off, just say, bless their heart. They came out today. It's good to have you out here. But one of the things my wife and I do when spring comes around is we have some spring cleanups. Now, now I know there's people already going, oh no, oh no, I'm gonna be told I'm already getting nudged. We need to clean up the garage or things like that. But, but one of the things it, it, it often makes us think through is what needs to be just cleaned up from winter. We've survived it, if you will, and, and it's time to deal with it. And one of those things in our lives is the, the junk drawer. Does anybody have a junk drawer? Or is it just our family? Some of you are like, one junk drawer? Oh, uh, uh, junk drawers, they're, they're interesting. In fact, I brought mine today. I ran it by Rebecca. But we brought our junk drawer, and I was, one of the pastors said, if you bring your junk drawer, don't look in it before church so that you're just as surprised in the moment. We want, we want to see that. Now, I've seen it. We had a first service, okay? So I've seen what's in it, but I tried to hold true to that. But, but I brought our junk drawer, and I really brought our junk drawer. And I, I was a little disappointed because we we're a little cleaner, whether we're growing in spiritual maturity or whatever. We're a little cleaner than usual. But, but I brought our junk drawer, all right? And we got things that everybody's got in their junk drawer, right? I mean, of course there's a level in the junk drawer. You got tape, what? You're probably expecting some scissors in here, batteries. We have a massive battery problem in our house, so we just get lots of batteries, okay? But, but there's, some, there's some, oh, 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 we're of that age where there's a reader in every single drawer. Any of you get that? Like, they're everywhere. Readers are everywhere. You never know when you got to change a light switch, you know, so just put that in there. You never know. You don't know. Oh, we got some fire glasses here. Let me try these on. You no, you never know. I didn't even know these were in here. We got all sorts of stuff. Oh, oh, painter's tape. You got to have that, right? Patent tape. Why do I have so many Allen wrenches? I've often thought I have so many. Is it because of Wayfair? I don't know what it is, but we got all these different things in our junk drawer. And you know what bothers me the most about the junk drawer? It's all my fault. I am to blame. And, and, and I could try to blame other people, but our family understands this is our junk. And when we allow it to get away or do all these things, it, it's not so easy because it's amazing what we cherish that we didn't even know we had. How many of you have stuff you didn't even know you had? Here's how you know. If you have a spouse or a family member who dearly loves you and they're throwing it out on you and you don't know they are, you have stuff you didn't know you had. And we compile all this junk and spring comes along. You go, okay, it's gonna be painful, but it's time to go through it. And to do what? I often find whenever you're cleaning out any junk in your life, whether it's the junk drawer, which you're all gonna do this week, whether it's the garage, whether it's your car, dear Lord, if you own a minivan and multiple children, right? What happens under there, right? 
There's Cheerios from like 2012 under that, right? Like this stuff piles up on us, right? And it's amazing what we will put up with, isn't it? Isn't it amazing? And then when it's time to finally go through our junk drawer of life and we start digging in and start, some of it's like, ah, I wanna get rid of that. You never know if we'll need that. You know how we justify our, ah, yep, we'll probably need that. I mean, there's no reason I won't need keys to a car we no longer have. I mean, there's no reason. I'm seeing that now for the first time. I didn't see that first service. <laughs> Junk. And, and, and that's what I was saying. It, it, there's times to reorganize, remove, retune, refine. There's so many re's that need to happen here. And sometimes it can complete, completely overwhelming. It's one thing when it's a junk drawer. It's another thing when it's your marriage. It's one thing when it's a junk drawer. It's another thing when it's your attitude. It's one thing when it's a junk drawer. It's another thing when it's your finances. It's one thing when it's a junk drawer. It's another thing when it's your business practices. And it's amazing the junk that piles up that we sometimes never address, step over, slide past, ignore, that keeps coming in on our lives. And it's those moments when we stub our toe and fall on our junk, those moments where someone cleans something up and we're like, oh, look at that, we should do that, that come along and create what we're gonna call a season of change. Now, I like to listen to leadership podcasts and every once in a while, I, I get some information and I find really, oh yeah, I wanna write that down. I wanna, get, I wanna make a note of that. And I was listening to uh, something from uh, John Maxwell. He does a lot of leadership stuff. And he says, there's four seasons for change in people's lives. People change in these four seasons. And he said, typically it would take me four sermons to deliver this, but I have a particularly smart crowd. I'm gonna give it in a minute. So I was listening to this, okay? And I think it got posted a bunch of places as well. But, but he gives out these four seasons of change. And, and here's the other, see if you're in any of these seasons of change in your own life. Here's the first one. When they've hurt enough, they just have to. You know what? The pain is too great. Where we're at right now, it's too much. It's starting to affect other things. It's starting to impact people we didn't want it to impact. This knee is driving me so nuts, right? Something like that, right? It's, it hurts too much, I gotta do something. That's the first season of change. Here's the second one he said. He said, when they've seen enough, they feel inspired to change. Oh, oh, look what Joanna Gaines just did to that house. We need to do that, right? Oh man, oh, I was watching Love It or List It and we decided we're listing it. Okay, we gotta do something. Like I feel inspired to change, right? We go through seasons where we see something and we go, I wanna do that too. Then when they've learned enough, they now desire to. What do you mean? Those moments when I didn't realize it was that unhealthy for me. I, I, really, I really wanna change that diet that I was doing. I didn't realize what I was consuming was hurting me so much. They, they, they've learned enough, they now desire to. Did you know that if you save this much through this, you'll have this at the end of your life? No, I, I didn't. I've learned enough. I, I'm inspired to, I want to. And then finally, when they've received enough tools, if you will, that they have the ability to. I, I now can do it. I am capable of doing it because now I have received the ability. I've passed the test. I have finished the degree. I'm now in a season where I actually can move forward. He calls those the four seasons of change. I apply that to the junk drawer tr principle. There's moments in our life where we reach in and an exacto knife gets us and we say, I'm hurting too much, something's gotta change in this drawer. We come to moments in our life where we clean up another area of our house and we go, you know what? I should probably clean 
that up. We, we come to a pot, spot where you learn, hey, it would be better if this was organized. So we wanna reorganize and refine and retool and rethink so many things of our lives. It's in those moments of change. But just as I said, everything in there is either my fault or somebody in my family's fault. It's not so easy to go through a junk drawer of life because there's things that have happened along the way that have made this very difficult. I would love, I would love to reorganize my finances, but do you know the mess I've made for myself? I would love, I would love to restore my marriage, but do you know the mess it is? I mean, I would love to have a better attitude, to have a better thought life, but do you know the mess I've made out of my mind by what I'm watching, what I'm listening to. It's a mess. I don't even know where to start because I can't just go back and hit the precious reset button. It's gonna take so much work and even pain to reorganize this. But that's the beauty of the God of scripture. He is a God of second chances. We're gonna see that today in this text. And because of that, we can learn something from the junk drawer principle. And it's not a quote that's mine per se, but I love it. It's this, just because you can't go back and change the beginning doesn't mean you can't start where you are and change the ending. Isn't that good? I can't go back. I create all this junk. I can't just hit reset. Whoosh, it doesn't work that way. There's so many people involved. I should probably run it by my wife or my kids or my husband if I'm gonna take this and reorganize. I can't just do that. But you could start where you are and change the ending. You don't understand. I'm like been the worst dad ever. I can't go back. And my son now is this. You can't go back and change the beginning, but you could start where you are and change the ending, how? Well, to answer how, let's use a prophet from scripture who was running from God's call. God told him to go to Nineveh and he said, no, and ran to Tarshish. In our first week, we asked ourselves on the Joppa docks of life, am I gonna do the hard right thing or the easy wrong thing? Jonah chose the easy wrong thing on Joppa dock and headed for Tarshish. And we found him the second week on a Jonah boat, if you will, hiding in the bottom of the vessel. God hurls wind sends this massive storm where the sailors throw him overboard to calm this God of Jonah. And we asked ourselves in those moments where we're hiding from God and he tells us everything will be exposed. Are we gonna be humble or are we gonna be humiliated? Jonah was humiliated and we finished that week with him sinking into the water. In our third message, the Jonah song, we find Jonah reflecting on his time inside of a great fish that God sent to miraculously save him. Saying, while I was fainting away, while I was drowning, the God of Jonah came for him. We suffer when we sin and God doesn't want his kids to suffer. And therefore he says, stay away from sin. And Jonah was grounded, if you will. And we asked ourselves, are we in a belly of purpose? Those moments in our life where we've done something wrong and we're suffering the consequences, but even in there, God is working his grace. Are we in a prison of purpose where we're just going through a difficult trial and God's gonna use even those chains for greater effectiveness? And today, we're gonna call it the Jonah clock. Those moments in our life where God says, I want repentance now. So running from God, hiding from God, grounded by God to today, changed by God.
He who knows what to do and fails to do it, to him, it is sin. Would you pray with me as we open Jonah chapter three and we learn what it takes to clean out the junk drawers of our lives. Heavenly Father, use your word. If it needs to, to hurt us a little bit, it might be a little painful. Sometimes renovations demand demo. Lord, inspire us as we look at someone else's life or maybe even what not to do. Lord, help us to learn so that we want to. And then Lord, give us the necessary tools we need so that we can change. For Lord, I believe that everyone listening or in this building today is here and tuned in because of your sovereignty. You want them to hear this. This is a message that is often not delivered from the pulpits of many churches, but repentance has to be taught if second chances are to be given. And so Lord, may we all humbly come before your sacred text and hear from you what you would like, not only from those of back then, but for your children even right now. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. It's Jonah 3. I love this first verse. I love this first verse because this is the same God of Jacob. This is the same God of Mary. The same God of Jonah says to Jonah, the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. How many of you have completely blown it and been given a second chance? There's a, there's a, a little rhyme we all know. I, I guarantee you're gonna know it, ready? April showers bring May flowers, right? Right, we, we just all know these things, right? Why? why? I don't know, kindergarten, something happened, right? And we, and we heard these things, right? Where April showers bring May flowers, okay? Um, there's something in scripture that seems to play out time and time again. Jonah has come to a season of repentance. And so I would say authentic repentance springs forth second chances, Are you here today and you'd like a second chance at this drawer? You'd like a second chance at some of the junk that's been built up in your life? Well, good news. God is a God who provides second chances. And just because you can't go back and change how it began, you could start now and change how it ends. So what's the second word? God says to Jonah, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. He comes back with a similar message than the one in chapter one. Go to Nineveh and cry against it, which is language, or call out against it. It's language of a prophet. The prophet spoke for God during this time period. And they would go and speak a message, often of judgment, that would tend to motivate the crowds to a season of change. And so Jonah being a changed man, even though, can you believe, scripture, it, it kind of indicates, it says Jonah spent three nights and, and three days, or whatever, in the whale or the fish, and then he called to God. I mean, how stubborn was this guy? I mean, one lick, I'm, I'm, I'm praying, right? <laughs> I mean, this guy was incredible. I'd rather die than do God's will. Hold up, who needs that? I I don't even, I'm so angry at how my life's played out. I don't care if I drowned. And then you do drown. And you find yourself surrounded by the junk you've allowed. And this incredible God, child of God, if you're here today, this incredible God comes even in those moments What will Jonah do now that his heart has been changed a little bit? So Jonah, scripture says, arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. How many have been with us throughout the series and you heard us hear Jonah went down to the dock in Joppa 
He went down into the boat. He went down into the whale. How many were here for that? Can you see this text? Is anybody reading this? Now we see arise and go to Nineveh and he arose and went to Nineveh. You see, when we're running from God and we're doing the things that God does not want for us, this is the way, I'm I'm gonna visually do this. We're going down, okay? When we are following God, even if it's into something as scary as Nineveh, as uncertain as Nineveh, we're going up. We're going up. Jonah has hit rock bottom and he's headed back up. Now, Nineveh, scripture says, was a great city, three days journey in breadth. So it's, so it's this large city. It seems to have a large circumference. There's an aspect where um, those who have studied kind of the geography of this have said, ah, was it really a three day journey? Was Nineveh that big? But it could be referring to even the suburbs of the city of Nineveh. But it also could speak to what was common back then when an embassy or somebody was visiting, they would, they would go and they'd spend a day just visiting and going around the city. Then the second day they would meet with leadership and then the third day they would pronounce something. And so that kind of satisfies even those kind of thoughts that there's this was big city. And remember, if you've been with us, Nineveh had this massive walls, it was fortified, but these people were incredibly unstable, wicked and evil. I mean, this city prided itself in being able to keep people alive the longest while skinning them to death. This is a torturous people. This is a people that were torturous to children, torturous to one another. There were evil and violence. And violence is one of those things that gets God's attention. We see that even in the story of Noah. There's a violence and there was tremendous violence in the city of Nineveh. And so Jonah comes in. And Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out. Now, many of you are like, where's the verse where he gets thrown up onto the beach? I told you, I'm fighting veggie tales like crazy here, okay? I mean, we, we, we know that he was spit up, okay? But some of the stuff, it, you took a little poetic license, okay? But we know Jonah headed towards Nineveh now, okay? And he's coming from that experience. Now, now remember we studied, even the Princeton Theological Review wrote of the man that spent 48 hours inside of a whale's mouth. And they talked about his skin was bleached completely white, okay? So this guy comes into town having come out of a fish. Keep in mind, Nineveh worships Dagon, who was a man fish. Their idol had a man and a fish together. Isn't it interesting somehow God often will leverage his messengers, but he will also prepare his audiences. On top of that, Researchers have found that Nineveh could have been under threat at that time specifically from other Assyrian empires, let alone, let alone the cities around them. And so the threat of them being sieged was always a prevalent threat. Some feel, is it possible that they use the phrase was a great city, referring to past tense, that it was falling apart and in a dangerous place, I, I tend to not think that, that it was just describing a great city at the time, but either are possibilities. But you have this guy come walking in, bleached white. He probably had a beautiful head of hair like mine at, at this point, right? And, and, and he's got this message. He came out of a fish, rumors spreading, okay? They didn't have news reports, okay? So rumor is spreading, this guy, this guy, this guy showed up. What's he going to say? He's walking around and he has a message and it's a five word message in the original Hebrew. Five words, it's not a big message. It's a short sermon with tremendous power. He says this, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Unless you repent. Does anybody see that there? No, it's not in the next verse either. Uh, unless, unless you cry out to God. Do you, nope, it's not there either. Jonah walks in, younger generation, stay with me for a minute. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. He takes the mic, boom, and goes up on top of the hill. Some of you know chapter four. 
Jonah's up on top of the hill. What do you think Jonah's doing? Oh, I bet I know what Jonah's doing. He hates Nineveh. He's got the popcorn, his lawn chair. He's waiting for 40 days. July 4th, go get him. Boom, 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 boom. That's what Jonah wants to see. 40 days starts the clock. 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. 40. It, it, it's a number of judgment as well as even temptation. Where have you heard 40 before in the scriptures? Anybody remember that guy named Noah? Where the world was being judged? He spent 40 days and 40 nights. You've heard of uh, my hero, Jesus, who was tempted for 40 days in the wilderness. It's a time of judgment as well as testing. And God tells Nineveh, 40 days and you will be overthrown. You're done. We live in an age of grace. Some people read the Bible and if they don't understand it holistically and they read it like a reference material instead of the incredible history and the novel that it is. They say, why is God so different in the Old Testament than he is in the New? And I'm gonna illustrate why God is so different visually. This is why. Someone went like this. His name was Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Scripture says all the wrath against sin, all the wrath against sin was put on Jesus. In doctrine, they use the word propitiation. It can mean to appease the wrath of God. It's as if this God that we see as incredibly angry at sin and still is, he hasn't changed his view of sin. So why does it feel we sin and get away from away with it? It's called the word called grace, okay? Why do I get grace as a child of God? Because Jesus came along and said, all that wrath of that Old Testament God, you couldn't touch the ark or you're dead. If, if you committed uh, fornication, if you committed anything like that, you were dead. You just, they, they like ended the lives. People would get stoned all these things, all this wrath, Jesus said, hit me, and he did. Him so hard, he died. But victory was on that cross. We're gonna celebrate in a few weeks, hopefully with a larger auditorium. And Jesus died, three days later rose again, and whoever believes in him gets to be treated with grace because the wrath of God was put on Jesus and not those who have accepted Jesus as their savior. That's why there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. But here we get to see how much God hates sin. This isn't preached in a lot of pulpits. Repentance doesn't come up a lot, but there is a time for it. And there is a time to say, God, I gotta change now. If you were to sit down with your Lord and he would say, I want you to change that, what would it be, teenager? If you say, can I have your phone? Would you say, can I first, can I first, before I give it to you, Lord, can I first um, go through my song? College student, if the Lord said, I want that to change now. Give me the remote. Can I first delete a few things that I've been watching and doing stuff like that? Before you look at it, I want that. Husband, I want that to change now. Wife, I want that to change now. What would it be? Probably whatever first came to your mind when I asked it. You see, we often know what God wants us to stop doing. And praise God, in the age of grace, we don't get 40 days and discipline begins. But there are times when the Holy Spirit goes, that's it. 
I had you listen to this sermon because I wanted to convict you this morning. That's the spot. Dad's in here. Dad's, you have any little kids? Hey, bud, stop it right now. That needs to stop. That's the moment. It's not time for why. It's not time for only if. It's stop it. This needs to stop. God says to Nineveh, your violence, your sin, your evil, I've seen it, stop it. And in this time period, I'm stopping it for you in 40 days. And the clock starts. How will Nineveh respond? How many of you know the story? Jonah probably heads up to the hill right now to get his popcorn. They're going down, I hate them. They're such a threat to our people. And the people of Nineveh believed God. Wait, what, what? They called for a fast and put on sackcloth. If you're a little newer to church, a fast means they're not eating, okay? And if they put on sackcloth, we're gonna get into that in a minute because that, that had indications too, okay? Now, from the greatest of them to the least of them. Okay, so just not the commoners. I mean, even the leaders, yeah, yeah. They all put on sackcloth. What is going on here? The, the word reached even, even to the king of Nineveh. Well, what will he do? He arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. What? W wicked Nineveh is in sackcloth and ashes? And many of you sit back and go, well, we know what that means. Sackcloth was an outward expression of an inward decision. They are humbling themselves before Jonah's God. In a polytheistic culture, they did not ever want to upset any God, let alone some Jonah's God. So they believe there's a God that is upset with them and they get in sackcloth. Now, now this isn't sackcloth. This is our, our kindergarten's um, racing sacks, okay? But the idea is such that they covered themselves in a sackcloth material made out of, um, of goat's hair, animal hair. They made, made this and, and they would cover themselves. On, we're gonna just, they're covering themselves with sackcloth to indicate humility and, and sadness over the state of themselves. Yes, but if you know this about scripture, we see a lot of sackcloth practices, but there's a few practices when ashes are used. So there's more mourning. And that's often when a nation is mourning, not just an individual is in sackcloth, but the nation is mourning. And they also sit then in ashes and sackcloth. Can you remember when that happened in scripture? If you're familiar with the story of Esther, that is exactly what happened. There was a national mourning that was going on. David covered himself in sackcloth. We see different prophets covering themselves in sackcloth to say inwardly, it wasn't the sackcloth, it was the expression of, I'm humbled. The, the, probably the best I could do for us is when you get on your knees or you lay prostrate before God. It's just to say, I'm not only doing it inwardly, I want to physically show you this. And so the king, he, he, he issues a proclamation. Look how serious he gets. He published it throughout Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd or flock, taste anything. They felt the animals were, were involved in this too, so they got everybody involved. He said this, he continued, let them feed, not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God that you, God there is not Yahweh per se. So they're just, there's this God out there and we, and we don't know what to do. So we can't necessarily assume salvation. We just know they don't want to be punished by this God. He continues and says, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Stop right now. I was a youth pastor for 10 years before becoming a lead pastor here. It's getting longer and longer ago, so I'm not even gonna talk about when, but one of the things I did one time is say, hey, scripture says, guys, do nothing out of complaining. Now, I know teens never complain and they learned it from their parents who never complain. And they learned it from the grandparents and grandparents, they never complain. I'm being facetious. We all complain. 
We all complain, but we, we had this thing. Here's what we're gonna do, our youth minister. I was like, all right, guys, let's see if we can't keep ourselves from complaining for one week. We're gonna complain fast. Have you ever tried to fast from something that you know is something you should change? It's amazing. We often joke here at church, it's like when you buy a Honda Civic, you see how many millions of people own Honda Civics, right? You had to buy the car till you saw it, right? But once you buy it, it's like, oh, there's one, oh, there's one, there's, there's one. When you say, I don't want to do something and you kind of focus on it, you're shocked how much you complain. And so we had this challenge and some of the teens came back the following Sunday. I said, how did everybody do? And a lot of them said, I didn't get past Monday. Because I woke up Monday morning, it's like, oh, I hate school. I'm like, ah, yeah, we should have saw that one coming. I didn't get very far either, but it was interesting because I noted each time I did that week and before it wasn't a big deal. But when you begin to conquer something that you know is something God doesn't want you doing, it's almost like an onion. He peels off a layer of complaining spirit and then exposes something else about you you hadn't seen before. Hey, that didn't sear my conscience last week, and now it does. You see, as we grow in the process of sanctification, we will learn these moments of repentance and cleaning out junk drawers are not one time. I've cleaned out my junk drawer way too many times, but I gotta keep going back because this is something that's part of my life. I junk myself up. He says, let's stop. We're gonna turn from our evil way and not do it anymore. And he says something unbelievable, unbelievable. Where you start to get this indication that the king of Nineveh is getting this moment even more than Jonah. He says, who knows, who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. Who knows? Jonah didn't say that would happen. The king's going, hey, let's go for it. Why are they so motivated to change? I think because they've heard enough, they know they have to. 40 days, clear out the junk drawer. They've heard enough because they have to. They've seen enough. This guy came out of a fish. He's got a message. They've learned enough. We got 40 days. And now they have the ability to maybe do something about it by putting on sackcloth and ashes. Who knows? Maybe God will relent. 40 days. Opportunities. It just, I kept, 40 days. It just was thinking it through my own personal life. We see this throughout scripture as well. It seems as if opportunities for repentance, there's doors that are open and then there's a time when it ends. Scripture speaks about this all the way into the book of Revelation. Right now, the door for repentance is open. There will be a day when it's not. And God has offered to all those who have never called upon the name of the Lord to be their savior, a chance to turn from their evil and come to him. And throughout scripture, we see one prophecy after one prophecy after one prophecy being fulfilled all the way up to Palm Sunday in the exact day of the triumphal entry, as well as his death and resurrection. What makes you think the prophecies of Revelation won't come true when all of the others in scripture have? And scripture says, when you see the day drawing near, it's not gonna sneak up on you, church. Brothers and sisters in Christ will go, you know what? I'm kind of seeing the day is drawing near. You're gonna have a hard time talking to anybody who's studied scripture and doesn't have a sense where they feel like they see the day drawing near. Is it possible in God's sovereignty, which means he's in control of all things, he had you here today, not because he hates you, but because he loves you and he wants this to be your season to clean out the junk drawer or maybe even more 
to come to him? What will happen to Nineveh? When God saw that they, what they did and how they turned from their evil way, when he saw what they did, when he saw that they were truly repentant, he relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them and he did not do it. Church, we've been learning some principles about God and about sin and about grace throughout the book of Jonah. Apply it to your junk drawer. Sin will do three things. It will cost you more than you wanted to pay. I can't believe we bought all this stuff. I mean, we're overwhelmed in all our junk. Sin will keep you longer than you wanted to stay. This is gonna take forever to clean this mess up. Sin will take you farther than you wanted to go. I never thought it would get to this. But grace, the same God of Jonah who offers second chances is the same God who gives his kids grace. Grace will always pay more than you were able to pay. Jesus gave his very life. He put such a high price on you that he was willing to die for you. Sin will, grace will always keep you longer than you were able to stay. Grace came after Jonah when he bailed on God. There are those in this room who may have gone through seasons in their life where they said, you know what? If that's God, I'm out of here. And God just keeps coming for you, doesn't he? He just keeps coming for you. You're like, would you even leave me alone? He just keeps coming. And he keeps bringing people into your life who go, you gotta hear about my church. You gotta hear about this Jesus. And he keeps coming for you. Why? Because he loves you. And grace will take you farther than you were able to go. I can't clean this up. Oh, 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 what's that? That's the Holy Spirit going, can I help? Can I help you clean it up? What are you gonna take? I mean, there's very precious things in there. Are there? Well, I mean, I I might use them one day. You need to stop, like like let him in because grace can do that. In scripture, there seem to be some verses that speak of these re moments, right? Where re things can occur. We can return to God. We can rejuvenate our spiritual life. We can restore our relationship with him. We can re these things. In fact, it's, it's Psalm 30, 11. He says, the psalmist says, you have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness. Even scripture is telling us throughout, true repentance springs forth second chances. Is it possible today is your day to call out to God and say, I repent. I need to change that. And it needs to stop now. Because just because you can't go back and change the beginning, it doesn't mean you can't start right here in March, 2023 and change the ending. You understand, Chris, I've been such a bad this, or I've been such, you don't understand all the junk I got. And yes, yes, you can't just reset it. As fun as that would be, there are other people that are living inside probably that junk. But let's start. And let's start with a few things that need to be removed. Let's maybe look at a few things that need to be reorganized. Let's look through a few things that we can start right where we are and get that thing cleaned up. But it's gonna take humility. Are you willing to let the Lord kind of dig into your junk drawer? Is he allowed to look through iTunes and look at a few of the songs? Is he allowed to check out the YouTube links and kind of reevaluate some of the things you've been junking yourself up with? Is he allowed to come into a few relationships that they're pulling you further from God, not closer? Is he allowed into your financial situation? Are you willing to let him come in and say, would you help me clean this out? He wants to, and he wants to start today. With ever I share the junk drawer dynamic, I talk about one of the greatest junk drawer songs or psalms of all scripture. And that's Psalm 
51. You know who wrote Psalm 51? David did. And it's a song, so I thought I'd have a Spencer come out and play underneath it as I read it to you. It's a song of repentance. <laughs> and it seems as if there are seasons in our life when it's time to clean some stuff out. And if you don't know how to do it, David gives you a template. In fact, he gives you, if you will, a six-step process towards repentance. And with repentance come second chances. But I don't know how long that season will be. And once it starts, I don't know when it'll close. None of you are guaranteed you'll be here next Sunday. None of you are guaranteed you'll go to school Monday. None of you are guaranteed you'll graduate college. I've been in pastoral ministry too long. I've seen too many tragic deaths. I've seen too many disease deaths. I've seen too many suicides. None of us know what the future holds. And if there's an opportunity on this side of heaven and you get one go, one go, do you know whether you have accepted Christ as your savior? And if you have, make repentance part of your prayer life. How? Let me give you six re-words from Psalm 51. David had just been confronted by the prophet Nathan who said, what would you do if someone killed someone to get away with something? And David said, I'd kill that man. And Nathan turned to him and said, David, you are that man. And so Psalm 51 is written to the choir master. It's a Psalm of David. When Nathan the prophet went to him after he had slept with Bathsheba and killed her husband at war. David is broken, humiliated, defeated, and at rock bottom. His life is drowning and he calls out to his God. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. Repentance begins with a request for mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. Repentance continues with release. David says, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you only I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Repentance begins with request and it continues with release. David feels so much shame. It's as if he's going through life going, if anybody knew the real me, they would hate me. David says, my sin's ever before me. Almost like his sin is a hand. It's before him at work. It's before him wherever he goes. And it just stays with him. And he says, would you release me from that shame? New Testament believer, child of God, there is no condemnation for those in Jesus Christ. Do not let the devil shame you. Let the spirit convict you. Release yourself from guilt by confessing it and telling him what you did. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth and in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Repentance continues, request, release, repent of any sinful thing. I was taught by a mentor who was a spiritual man in my life. He said, Chris, go ahead and just name the sin. God knows what you did. Just say it out loud in your prayer life. He knows. In fact, when you actually say what you did, 
it actually has more power than just going, God, you know what I did. Tell them what you did. I didn't say that very nicely to that person. Say what you did. Repent of it. Repent means to agree with God that this is wrong. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. The very verse that inspired our church's name. Renew. I I need you to renew my heart. Scripture's clear. We can't do the renewing. He has to. In fact, it's the Holy Spirit that does the renewing within the mind as in the spirit of a man. In your prayer life, have you ever asked the Holy Spirit to renew your heart? It's got a lot of junk in it. And I need you to renew my heart to even want to clear the junk out. Cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. We request, we release, we repent, we renew, we restore. God, restore my dependence on you. We're not capable of clearing this junk drawer out ourselves. We'll ignore things we shouldn't. We'll leave stuff stick around that shouldn't still be there. We'll try to keep him from coming in. But we learn from Jonah, there's no hiding from God. And he don't come in that drawer because he hates you. He's coming in because he loves you. And he doesn't want sin to continue to let you suffer. David says, Lord, I know you'll do this and I will then teach transgressors your ways and sinners I'll return to you. Oh Lord, open my lips and my mouth. I will declare your praise. Restore and then finally return. Return my effectiveness. I've gotten all junked up. I'm no good to anybody. All I do is complain and I'm frustrated. I'm defeated and I'm discouraged. Lord, I need you to come in here and reorganize this drawer, if you will. I went through the book. I saw how many reads can I find in Psalm 51? I found a few. So these are now on my phone, this list. And in those moments in my life where I need to request mercy from discipline, or those moments where I say, remove all my impurities, release me from my shame, recognize my confession to you, reveal my secrets, repent. I repent from all sin, refine my life like snow, rebuild my broken heart, Lord, restore my joy for being saved, renew my unwilling soul, my soul's tired, God, return my effectiveness, rescue me from my guilt, retune my mouth to praise your name. And guess what? Results come from repentance. Anybody want a second chance? No, no, it's true. You can't go back and change the beginning. We put the junk in there but you can start right now and change the ending. I'm gonna leave this list up and we're gonna close in prayer together because I truly believe a church that is repentant is a church that's humble. In order to preach this message, guys, I went through this multiple times just to make sure I'm good, but I know it's a daily process. Lord, where is it? Because there's not a perfect person in this room. Let's close in prayer and you can look at that list if you will and see if any of those, the Holy Spirit goes, that one. And when I asked you, where would the Lord want you to change? Maybe that's the part of the drawer he wants to go first. And don't be surprised if you clear that out, a few others pop up because that's part of the sanctification process. And the beauty is, child of God, you don't have to do this to get him to love you. He loves you regardless of your junk. In fact, there's no junk in there that would make him love you less. He is simply saying, can I help you get this out so we can have an opportunity to spring forth into what's next? Are you desiring to say, come on in? renovation start today.
take a few just by yourself and I'm gonna have Spencer close us in song prayer to end the service.